Okay, should we launch into this, Amy, yeah. and make things happen? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. So uh, welcome everyone to tonight's program, Decoding the News with David Wallace. My name is Amy Lusto, and I'm the Community Outreach Librarian here at the Belmont Public Library. Thank you all for being here and to the Friends of the Library for helping make this event possible. I invite you all to get in touch with me with any questions or program ideas, and I'll put my email address and phone number in the chat. Please also fill out our survey at the end, and I'll put that link in the chat as well. Just to note, we will be recording tonight's session and stopping before the Q&A session. So we'll do Q&A at the end. Feel free to put your questions in the chat as they occur to you if you like, and we'll start with those. So without further ado, David Wallace is a former business and tech reporter for the New York Times and Reuters and journalism lecturer at Boston University. Thanks so much, David. Take it away. Thanks for having me. And I'm hoping that you'll be able to tell me what is on your share um, as I try to balance both uh, some slides that we'll get through pretty quickly and uh, the purpose of the slides essentially is to sort of do some level setting and start things going on the discussion um, and get around to a number of questions that you have or websites that you want to take a look at and pressure test or find out more about. Um, and the purpose of the slides essentially is just by way of introduction, um, as well as explaining uh, a, a little bit of background of, uh, yes, I used to do things. And probably the best way to uh, get started is a, a little bit of both trust building and introduction, um, largely because I'm not that David Wallace. Um, there are a number of people I get confused for. Um, here are a few. And I'm curious to know what you're seeing. I'm still seeing Keynote as a live working document rather than full screen. So yeah, it's not tell, full screen. tell me what you're seeing. It's not full screen. OK. And if I share Keynote again, more better <laughs> and try to run slide only. How does that do? Uh, it's a little better. I'm still seeing the panel on the right hand Panel side. on the right. OK. So let's go to play. Yeah, there we go. And I'll try my best to keep up. Um, the reason I'm showing you this is not just it, because it's a topic I know a lot about. Um, I've been David Wallace longer than most people. Uh, I've been a small Nigerian man, thanks to a 1990s uh, personal identification scam. Uh, fortunately, I was able to write about it and make some dough out of the experience. Uh, but the point of the exercise in this case is to look for proof, um, look for information that confirms not just your suspicions or your details, um, what you think might be hypothetically potential. Um, let's get into the, the really nitty gritty details of building trust in your news because you'd like to be able to believe the details that you're seeing, but you often have to dig a little deeper. Um, it's a job, it's a lot of work, and unfortunately, it can take up a lot of time. Um, I'm going to go over my details very quickly in the hopes that um, it both builds trust and like any good reporter, it gets you to come out of your shell and trust that this is an educational discussion. It's not a judgment of what you do or don't do, um, read or don't read. My concern is not how you vote, it's that you vote. So getting back to my details, yes, I did work at Emerson College and Boston University, but as an adjunct instructor, I was called professor by students who were very polite, but I was not a professor. 
Um, I have written for a number of national and international publications, but as a contributor, not as a staff writer. That matters in terms of my credibility and telling you the full details so that you don't go and start bragging on me that somebody from BU told me X because I don't have an affiliation at Boston University. I haven't been paid by them in quite some time. The point of the mention of my credential is that I am a has-been. I used to do stuff. So is it useful in terms of building credibility? Yes. Is it a, a shade of gray in terms of my self-deprecating sense of humor? Also, yes. Uh, this is where we have to talk about what is news, what is information that's useful to you, because it may not be the same as what's useful to me, and vocabulary matters. Reference librarians are very helpful, and they matter, so don't be surprised if I throw a few shout outs in the general direction of the reference desk at the Belmont Public Library. Um, the first few of these slides are going to focus on what is news and how you can tell the difference between what is news information, what is opinion information, what are the different kinds of journalism that go on, because it's often not explained to you in a way that is obvious or a way that is um, clear in that for an example, when I was writing as a contributor to certain newspapers, I would get a byline that said my name and the phrase for the inquirer. It didn't say inquirer staff writer because those were reserved for people paid a salary by the Philadelphia Inquirer. So their way of identifying freelance contributors was to say in the byline that it's different from an inquirer staff writer. Um, other publications don't do that, or there are certain tells, like if there's a contact information for the reporter, it doesn't say the name of the news organization. It says Yahoo or Hotmail or Gmail, telling you that they're getting info at or personal email that isn't part of the news organization that you're reading. And that's a way that you as a contributor or as a, a consumer can tell who's a contributor, who's a freelancer, who's a potential columnist. And then when that changes to staff writer, staff columnist, um, there are different ways, whether it's radio or uh, TV or news and web, newspaper and web, how you can tell the difference between who's being paid by the news organization, who's a trusted contributor, but still a freelance contributor, and what are the different kinds of information that are being passed along. Um, you're going to hear me say information or news in a way that I don't talk about media, because media is the thing. It's the CD, it's the website, it's the device or the medium that gets you information. The news is the words, the images, the information is the data. It's the different types of things that you're gathering on a daily basis. And often who we trust, where we get our information, what we call it really matters. Uh, when we start throwing phrases around like misinformation or disinformation, um, there's a way that it gets mixed together or people have different definitions. It's my hope that we can talk about what are some of those definitions and the ways that it matters if you're talking with somebody and you're having a disagreement because you're talking about the same thing, but you're describing it in different ways. So here are some examples of what is news, um, what different from analysis and opinion. And frankly, in a 9 p.m. TV roundtable, you may get all three and have to really think hard about what is a, what part of this is news, 
what part of this is opinion and especially there are things that I call the name and blame and shame aspects of opinion discussion is if whoever's on your radio or TV starts naming specific people as if one person controls the entire fill in the blank. So for one example, the topic of the subhead of, of Chris Christie's new book is policies of the Biden administration. So what that does as a book title is it gives Joe Biden responsibility for everything in the federal government from the economy to any sort of federal policy. And it obviously names and blames him before I've even opened the book that this is going to be about the policies of a president that's only been in office for a year. Um, in terms of misinformation and disinformation, I define it in this way. Disinformation is a purposeful attempt to give you facts, give you opinions, give you information, and either false information that is factually inaccurate or intended to deceive. Misinformation is often accidental. It's something like you want to be helpful, so you're going to click retweet or forward or resend on a particular social post, and you might think you're being helpful. You might think that this is intended to be, you know, can you believe this? Um, when in fact, all you're doing is spreading what is actually disinformation. Um, often we hear about disinformation in terms of getting people not to vote because their vote won't matter. Uh, getting people angry about something in the headlines that they should, in theory, have an opinion about and start saying that this is good or bad. So news is fact. It's not good or bad. It's not pro or con. News is essentially a set of facts that we can agree on. Like it's dark outside, so it must be night. At least here it's night, but there are other parts of the world where the sun's shining. And yes, I could be proven wrong that it's night, but my reality, my truth, my situation is it's dark outside. So I'm calling it evening. And yes, for other people where the sun is shining, things are different. We need to be able to understand that multiple realities in that sense happen in the same hour, in the same time. Now would be a good time to launch a poll question, Amy, of where do you get, in, in terms of who are you in the room, um, how would you define your age group? Because often I have found that younger people, students especially, are much more prone to get their news from a social network, from friends. Um, older people, 40, 50, 60 and up, are tuning into news and TV, um, news on the radio, news on the, the web, um, they may be going to a, a site like the Boston Globe. Um, they might even go to a site like the AP, where it's a wire service providing you with information that is as objective as possible, but it's also sped up. It's designed to be fast because the wire services are feeding it to the Globe, the TV stations, the radio outlets. Uh, thanks for participating in the poll. Um, the other reason it's relevant where you get your news is if you're older and getting information from what I would call a standards-based news organization, um, a TV station, a radio station, a wire service, a news website, um, you're getting information that is vetted, like the slide said, two, two sources and an editor who's keeping an eye on things. Um, you're getting information that may be slightly slower, but it's factually more accurate than talking to somebody over the back fence. 
getting a text message, getting a panicky phone call from Uncle Ned that they just saw, a, a, he just saw something on the TV and I can't believe it. So if you're getting your information in that way, you don't know what Uncle Ned is watching. You might not be able to know for sure what the source of the, the headline is that you're supposed to be so angry about. Um, if you're getting information from a social media feed, again, you might not know where the information originates. Uh, there are an awful lot of people who think that Apple News and Google News do original news gathering and reporting, but they don't. They're gathering information from public sources and they're putting it on their platform. You may need to do a little digging of where it came from. Uh, you might need to look for attribution in the news itself to say, did they get this from a standards-based news organization? Is there a quote from somebody who was there and giving you firsthand information, as in, it's dark out? Um, should we share our results? It's a small group, it keeps things interesting. Um, and again, since I'm dealing with one screen, Amy, let me know if we can go back to the slides. Um, the other reason that I'm showing you the slide is when you get news from a neighbor, when you see a website like Nextdoor or citizen.com telling you there's a coyote in your neighborhood, your reaction is one of neuroscience. It's the prefrontal cortex causing you to stop and have to think about rational thought and not panic. Think about a more reasonable approach, not just react with your lizard brain and not just uh, have some sort of an angry reaction to whatever the information is. Um, that's another reason, frankly, why if a website says to you, get angry about this, you need to start of, you need to stop and take a, a poll, you know, sort of take a, a, a little time to think about what's the news model. Uh, with standards-based TV, radio news, you know that they're selling advertising. You know that you can lean back and watch the news because someone else is paying for it. If you're getting news pushed to you by a person or a news organization, um, you need to think about ways that they're trying to monetize your time. Uh, the ways that the organization is trying to make money by getting you to click here or donate and support our cause or spend more time on our website clicking through to figure out which of the Gilligan's Island characters you resemble because that's their business model. The number of times that you click, the number of minutes they spend telling you that you're information is it's on the next page. Don't worry, it's coming soon. Um, that's a way of getting you to basically pay for the news or pay for the entertainment of figuring out what Star Trek character you most resemble in a way that gets ads on that page or gets your time spent doing what the person on the other side of the website wants you to do. And frankly, that's part of the way that news is being hijacked. Information is being tailored so that it looks like news. It looks like somebody that you see from the waist up wearing a sport coat at a desk with a Chiron over their shoulder and perhaps a lower third, um, which if I had a better budget, I could probably do. But for right now, I'm kind of low budgeting it and I'm trying to help you out from a spare bedroom. Um, but thinking about the business model, thinking about the ways that your time, your web connection, your attention span and gullibility potentially is 
the raw material for people who are trying to get you to do something that is maybe not against your better judgment. I, I'm reserving all judgments about what Star Trek character you are, but I need to let you think about or let you marinate in the what is the time spent? What is the attention span? Am I getting all of my information from an outlet that I know has a particular bias or a particular point of view? Um, am I getting information from a news source that is generally legitimate and generally trusted, but has some potential problems? And we'll get into a couple of examples of those in a couple of minutes. Um, because it's been too long that I can speak, if there are questions, by all means, raise a hand. Uh, you can unmute yourself. You can throw it in the chat if you'd like to be anonymous. Um, I'm going to get through the slides pretty quickly, and I'm hoping that in another three or four slides, um, we'll have a, another opportunity for a sort of open discussion, and, and if there are one-on-one -on -one questions, uh, by all means, let's continue to play. Um, the reason, in, in my experience, the reason why we're seeing a lot of the news innovation is because TV news was so good for so long, was so standard for so long, from the 60s until about the 2010s, 2015, uh, where things started to get a little kooky in terms of the ways that the internet and web browsing and the differences made a big, big difference. Um, you and I are seeing different things on our web browsers depending on who our cable or internet provider is. Uh, whether we're using a particular browser type of window. Um, is it a Mac or a PC? Is it a broadband connection or is it dial-up? Um, are you clicking on ads and have you cleared your cache today? Um, if you're in a filter bubble, and that's sort of a term of art, meaning that if you click on cute pictures of Basset Hounds, the internet browser will dish you up more cute pictures of Basset Hounds. If you're cat people, that's okay, and it's no judgment, but the more you click on something, the more internet rewards you with more of that because the internet, unlike your TV in the old days, knows what you're clicking on, knows how long you're staying on a page, knows how deep you go into a particular website, and all of that information informs your next browsing. So I would encourage you to clear your cache, clear your browsing history, get out of your filter bubble, meaning if you normally read a paper that leans conservative like the Boston Herald, sometimes you might want to read the Globe. Um, if you go to a particular website that you know has a bias towards a particular point of view, meaning conservative versus liberal, pro-business versus not business, um, activist, meaning pro a particular point of view, and there are lots of those, um, go to one that has a neutral rating and we'll show some of those tools um, because it's easy to understand the news from a point of view if you know what that point of view is. Um, Pacifica Radio or television has a point of view that champions the underdog. Politically speaking, that usually means um, a minority at risk, disenfranchised audience, so worker focused as opposed to the owners of a business the minority party as opposed to the majority in a particular legislature. Um, their news is presented with a point of view about who they support. Um, 
are you seeing slides that say remember? No. Okay, so let me go back to Zoom and resume share. Um, better? Better. Um, so understanding what the bias is, what the audience is of the news outlets that you're choosing, um, that's one way to think about the ways that the information you're getting comes with a particular activist view. For example, Sierra Club may be giving you news that has a pro-environment bent. Um, there are different religious outlets that offer the news in the context of your choice of religion or your choice of country, if it comes from an international source. Um, there are lots of different ways that if you're getting information from a standards-based news organization, it should not have that point of view unless it says very clearly, we're offering you this opinion because it's our editorial position that the Globe supports X or that WBZ supports Y. And often those are charities um, their fund me, uh, go fund me sites in cases of tragedy, uh, an accident and weather uh, catastrophes, their different causes, but they're not going to be an issue like school lunch, like environment, like pro or con on very controversial issues like environment. Um, I'll pause just in case the nice folks from Stakem are lurking tonight. Uh, I want to give them a shout out. I've been doing it for about a year and a half now because I don't know if any of you are on the Twitter, um, but Stakem as a corporate decision decided that it was going to get involved in news and media literacy by using its Twitter and social platforms to educate people about what is relevant source, what is relevant news outlets, uh, what is a standards-based news organization, and what are the methods and best practices for gathering information. Um, it's been really successful. Stakem and others like the News Literacy Project, like several journalism schools around the country, um, they've all managed to get people into the big tent. Um, news Literacy Project is a program for teaching news literacy at the K through 12 level. Um, another shout out for the reference librarians, they use some of the News Literacy Project tools um, like Checkology, they're available for free on the line. Um, in case Stakem is not lurking, um, some of the other folks who are in this space are journalism educators. So the University of Rhode Island has a media literacy program. Uh, there's something in Florida called the Pointer Institute. Um, so all of this is part of the ways that we as consumers um, need to better understand that if we get information, from something that we think is reliable. Um, if, if it's a source we haven't heard of, we have to sort of stop and take five. We have to think about, um, is it reliable? Because you know the Boston Globe, it's got a hundred plus year history. It shows up in my driveway every morning. It's got a track record. It's got professional journalists. Um, we tend to think about reputation and give a, a heavier weight to details, to somebody who was there on the spot or somebody who has a track record as a journalist. Um, so you're going to have to take it on faith that this ceramic mug has a dark brown liquid that could be coffee, could be tea, could be a delightful Highland Park single malt whiskey, and decide which of those 
if any, really matter to you. Um, I don't think any of them, but I keep the mug here because it's tasty. And if it matters to you, I'll tell you the truth. If it doesn't matter to you, if your discussion of the news doesn't really depend on what's in my mug, what's on the screen, what do you believe, um, then we get into a, a, a little more of confirmation bias, things that are informational uh, because they agree with your view of how it ought to be. We like to look for cause and effect. We like to be at the cool kids table thinking about conspiracy theory because it's a puzzle. It's a thing that we're trying to unravel and make sense of. It's one of the reasons that when the economy is in turmoil, things like astrology that explain get very popular. Conspiracy theories get very popular because we're looking for certainty. We're hoping for information that explains not the kinds of, oh my God, this is terrible. It's random assortments of what are, is happening. And that's news. News is very often random until you look at it in hindsight and you can start to see causes and effects. You can start to see the reasons why a particular thing happened. There may be several causes. It's not the name, blame, shame of one person caused the entire stock market crash of 1929. There are multiple inputs, and you have to be able to think about the complications that come with multiple inputs. Um, it's rarely as simple as one person caused a blackout. Um, another good opportunity to put in a commercial announcement in case there are questions. Um, Amy, I don't know if the library prefers the CRAAP rubric for currency, uh, sorry, consistency, recency, accuracy as the five letter mnemonic. I forget what the last AP is. Um, some schools use the CRAAP model, some use smell um, as an example of here's what is useful uh, in understanding what you're seeing. Um, I'm a big fan of the last L, and I don't know if you can see the mouse, but I'm going around it, because if you're looking at what's there on the screen, on the page, be aware of what's left out. Um, did they talk to somebody from a pro position, but not a con position on a particular issue that has both sides? Um, did they talk to an older person, not a younger person? Um, there are things called man on the street interviews where you just get anybody who's on a street corner to have an opinion about the Patriots. What are the odds that in New England, you're gonna find somebody on a street corner who doesn't have a kind thing to say about Bill Belichick and the Patriots? Um, finding an expert who knows about football or about politics or about an issue, that's more of a source. Uh, that's somebody with information and expertise who's trusted, not just, hey, we needed to fill up time on the evening news, so we're gonna to talk to Joe and Jane Average, and we're going to get their thoughts about something very basic that everybody ought to know about or think about um, in the ways that news often on TV focuses on the obvious because everybody has the obvious. Everybody has weather. Everybody knows about weather. So if there's video on TV, it's not surprising you'll see video about somebody's weather. If there's a catastrophic weather event, um, same way, uh, it, oftentimes you'll hear a lot, just like at a cocktail party, about traffic and sports. They're kind of universal. Everybody's got them. 
And it really has to be unusual for a very local traffic or a very local sports story to get into a national or even a statewide sort of outlet. Um, it's why, again, when we talk about news, we have to define whether we're talking about news organizations like ABC, CBS, Reuters, NPR, uh, Fox, or are we talking about the hyper-local, very specific, the tab that used to run in your town, the small town newspaper, the blog that's put out largely by the local politicians because they're talking about something that's so specific it's not going to be terribly interesting outside of your town. So again, the examples of nextdoor.com or citizen.com. Um, some other spoof examples come up in the political world because people figured out, and there is a news story from the, the New York Times about this, that old reliable sounding websites uh, were being used to basically load up political information in elections to try and deceive voters. So say, for example, you were in Longmont, Colorado, and the website Longmont Ledger was available. You could buy that website, post all kinds of information about one candidate for the city council without having to post anything about the opponent without having to post anything that was detrimental because this is the Longmont Ledger. It looks like a news site, but all it is basically is political promotion that looks like news stories that supports a single candidate. And a lot of different ways that the web is being used to spoof you or to mislead you um, revolves around things that are election-based, that are opinion-based. They're time-sensitive. They need you to do something by a certain date, um, to be angry by a certain date, and call your congressperson about a particular issue, um, to get a vote in in your city council by a date specific. And then the site can go away. It can go dark and essentially be used in a way that is less diabolical, to use a phrase. So here's an example that goes to a phishing and personal security issue. Um, it's something I found out about quite by mistake, uh, which I often find is that people in these workshops have an example that I haven't run across. Um, they have a, a, an experience that I haven't seen and Frankly, if you've got one that you'd like to discuss, I welcome the opportunity. Um, there are lots of organizations out there doing the homework of what's the next phishing and hacking or disinformation campaign. Um, there's one called Digital Sherlock's. Uh, there are a couple that we'll talk about in the next few slides. Uh, organizations like Next City, or in Philadelphia, the, the Committee of 70 that are using their knowledge and experience with politics to especially try and stop disinformation or misinformation in the case of an election or in the case of a budget discussion where it really matters. Um, here are a couple of tools about photos because often we see doctored photos or we see point of view photos that are used in such a way to show, here's crowd size, for example, that shows either a lot of people or not a lot of people. Um, and you can use that sort of image, of somebody falling, somebody sitting. It's one still image. The video of that same activity might tell a totally different story but again, in that idea of blame and shame, one photo that shows something that you're supposed to be angry about or concerned about or involved in is often a way for people to use a photo that is 
evocative, that it's, it's designed to get a response from you. Um, I'll go back to the kittens and basset hounds picture. If the awe is what they're after and the adorable, that's great. If it's get angry or send money or the kitten gets it, clearly that's designed to motivate you because maybe you'll send money to animal rescue or a shelter or a cause and they'll use a particular image to illustrate that tugs on heartstrings. Um, here are a couple of other either suggestions for sites that do different things, uh, organizations that are involved. I've mentioned News Literacy Project um, in our backyard, Northeastern and Boston University's journalism programs, uh, the Shorenstein Center at Harvard. Um, it's at Harvard's Kennedy School. So there's a big program on fighting misinformation uh, across several of the study centers at Harvard. Uh, the Kennedy Center is involved in the public policy and the technology aspects of it because there is no penalty for doing any of this online. There's no rule of law that makes it illegal to mislead. If you are making claims that are scientifically or financially hurtful, um, we're starting to see organizations that file lawsuits claiming that harm was done or individuals saying that information about them that was harmful was posted by some that caused damage. Um, but there isn't a state or federal regulation that says you could be punished for putting misleading or flat out lies on the internet. Um, that's the policy aspect of it. The technology part that we've talked a, a little bit about in um, browser history or what the internet does well or badly um, is a topic that some of the technology experts or legal experts um, at Harvard at their Berkman Center um, have been looking at. Um, and these are some of the people who are doing the work, who are interested in the ways that Facebook or the owners of your news outlets are having an impact. Um, because the dollars follow the audience. And frankly, if you're going to spend your time online and be the audience, somebody is going to try and advertise to get you to buy a vitamin, to buy a car. Um, and there's a social as well as a financial reason uh, why this has become big business. So let's hit pause again and pause the share. There's a live window. If there aren't either questions or suggestions at the moment. I don't see any questions. Okay. So let's no. go to oh, maybe somebody had one. Okay. I'm just um, wondering, and I apologize for um, using my voice rather than um, the chat function, but um, I'm just a little confused about what would you recommend as a reliable news source? I mean, would you recommend that we watch TV? Would you recommend that we read the newspaper? Would you recommend a website rather than social media? I'm, I'm not I, I, sure like where to go from here. And I'm not sure also like if I were to choose uh, a certain you know uh format like when i should be questioning and when i can feel like what i'm getting is legitimate uh, so in general you know i, I i'm going to punt and say e all of the above in terms of news um i am going to tell you from an advice point of view 
to have a diverse news diet. Um, use TV when it's convenient, radio when it's convenient, um, understand the difference between radio news uh, that's a news broadcast versus an opinion discussion. Um, and if we can kill the poll window, Amy, because I've seen it, um, I'll try again to resume share. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that you can get news aggregated. So it isn't about the method as much, Susan, as the outlet itself. So I don't really care if you read the New York Times in paper on the web or listen to Michael Barbaro, who goes deep on a particular topic. Um, in terms of is the, the information reliable, um, use a site like All Sides or redblue.com if what you're talking about is, I want to see this information presented from a different vantage point. Um, I want to see, for example, the famously liberal Boston Globe and how it's reporting a certain news story and see if, um, for an example, if the story gets different treatment from a different news outlet. So this will be as big as I can make it, I think. Um, Let's see if I can X out of the chat window or poll window um, because oftentimes if your judgment is what's legitimate, what's not legitimate, um, I'd need an example or I'd need a better idea of what is a real news site versus what is a fake news site? What is, in your mind, a less legitimate source of information? I can say that for most part, I'm getting my news online, reading the New York Times online rather than on paper. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't know uh, like where, other than now that you're telling me about all sides, I wouldn't know if there was some sort of bias at the New York Times and that I should be looking at, like you say, a, another venue like television or radio or social media or just going to a, a website to 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 fact check or to yeah to fact check or to further understand what i'm seeing there right well and here's an example and and you know it's hard to say what the facts and how facts are are being made into opinions um, you know, whether you're pro-vaccine or anti-vaccine has become a political small p as well as capital P sort of issue. Um, so it's often framed in terms of a liberal progressive point of view versus a conservative or Republican point of view. Uh, I don't want to make this about party affiliation because it's often not driven by party, it's driven by, are you a conservative by nature person? Are you a progressive and liberal by nature person? Um, you know, those are, are personality rather than um, different party affiliations as the difference maker. Um, so Amy's also rightly, if you wanna dial up that page, um, there are lots of different tools that you can use to sort of decide for yourself uh, what is reliable information, what is the bias of a particular news outlet, because the facts on Fox News are facts. The opinions on Fox News 
when Fox News starts doing news and analysis late in the evening are not. Those are the personal ramblings and rantings of an individual in the same way that Pacifica News or MSNBC on the progressive side of the dial may be just as personally opinionated as the very conservative folks at OAN and Newsmax. The difference being the people at the progressive channels tend to not use bad facts and bad faith. Uh, they will give you a point of view. They'll be very clear about where they get their data, and they'll be very clear about the fact that they are championing a particular view. The folks at Newsmax won't tell you that they're being underwritten by AT&T. Uh, the folks at OAN won't tell you that they're only going to interview people who agree with their worldview. Uh, who support their candidate. And so that's a way in which, again, if you're thinking about what's missing, what's left out, um, they're not bringing you a democratic viewpoint on OAN. They're only going to show you the most red conservative Republican lawmakers. Um, Pacifica is going to use every opportunity to tell you what Bernie Sanders and the progressive wings of the Democrat squad. So that's a way that you can often shorthand what you're seeing as agreeing with your political viewpoint or disagreeing. So this chart that Ed Fontes has um, is similar to one that is used on the All Sides website. Um, it sort of identifies the news by political leaning. And note that it's news by political leaning, not the commentary, not the opinion pages, because the Wall Street Journal, for example, is giving you facts and news in the A section of the newspaper or on the website, but its opinion and commentary pages are much more rah-rah pro-business and anti-tax because of who their audience is. Other questions, other websites we should dial up? I don't see any other questions right now. I just wanted to say, I, I appreciate you sharing that other Link. I like the one that I shared because it's a little bit more visual. It, it shows sort of the um, two axes instead of kind uh, of. This it, one. it is a better visual because it also gives you, because of that two axis, it shows you, you know, most popular and most distributed, as well as the the political as well as the audience size because that really matters. But that's a really good point about the the news bias versus the um, the opinion section bias. I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions at the moment? So a, a couple more pieces of advice and suggestion of how to get news you want from experts um, is maybe not to go by the outlet anymore. Um, we're getting to a point for good or for ill that news gatherers have the same sort of need for independence that musicians and athletes did so maybe you need to start following by name or by byline, not just by the credibility of the news organization. Um, several examples that I can just toss off. Uh, Tom Ricks used to be a military correspondent for the Washington Post. He's gone on book leave and is now more of a book author, um, but he still has a social feed. He has a blog. He is still writing about US military issues, 
um, using that expertise, using that deep network and knowledge. It's just not under the byline of the Washington Post. Um, you often see uh, Dahlia Lithwick or Linda Greenhouse mentioned as experts on the Supreme Court. Um, they've covered this issue of the politics and the legal aspects of the Supreme Court for a number of different news outlets. Um, their past experiences at Slate or the New York Times is a credential, but it's not where their work is appearing currently necessarily. So in the same way that you might follow a concert orchestra conductor or a favorite individual instrumentalist from band to band, city to city, um, start thinking about what journalists you wanna follow and the expertise they have that no one else is going to be able to replicate. Um, and the last thought I would leave you with is if there's an issue that you feel very deeply about, there is a better than average chance there is a news outlet covering the day's activity or the local uh, who, what, when, where, how from that lens. Um, examples are the Boston Globe starting a dedicated news outlet by Globe minority reporters because there are people who are wanting to see the news from the lens of a black news gathering outlet. Uh, it still has to be standards based, it still has to be edited and proofread and all of those good things as part of a news organization, but it comes through the lens of a young urban black correspondent who has a different worldview than a 60 something white suburban person who may be covering the exact same event. So you're going to see a lot more of this as the news atomizes, as it gets more tailored to a particular audience by that particular audience, because it comes with a sensibility or an experience of lived history that's part of the news. And that's the context that informs what you're seeing on the screen or on the page. So be aware that the news is still changing. The information is still being gathered, we hope, um, but it's being presented in a lot more different ways than ever, from books to documentaries to tweets and Reddit and Instagram postings. So it's not as easy as it was to get your news fix. Um, it takes as much time as you're willing to put into it, um, but by all means, it's not a reason to drop out and stop being informed. So this would be a good spot to stop the recording, and if people either want to share or talk what we used to call in the biz off the record, um, with questions that are less socially acceptable. Um, I'm happy to hang around and see where Great. things go. Thank you so much, David. I am gonna stop the recording now. Um, so if people wanna think of other questions that they have, please feel free. <laughs>